أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن اهتدى بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد um, Before we get started, I would just like to ask if all of the brothers we can come closer For this is from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Whenever we are seeking knowledge, we sit close to the speaker, close to the person You know, we're learning from as possible, inshallah And the brothers who come later and those who have to pray in the masjid We won't be a hindrance to them Jazakallah khairan No wonder brothers there, excuse, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. This topic that, by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why I choose to speak on it today, is because sometimes we get caught up and we forget what it is to be a Muslim. We forget the importance of being a Muslim. We forget the core of the being of a Muslim and what Islam is. To quote a very famous person, Muhammad Iqbal, for those who don't know him, um, he said that, though it is from the east that the sun rises, showing itself bold and bright, without a veil it burns and blazes with inward fire. Only when it escapes from the shackles of east and west, drunk with the splendor it springs up out of its east, that it may subject all horizons to its mastery. Its nature is innocent of both east and west, though in origin true. It is an Easterner. And this is referring a little bit to Islam. It's lines of poetry translated, and they don't truly bring out the meaning of it. And we, are, we have to look back at what the core of Islam is and the core of the human being before we can understand ourselves as Muslims. According to the theory of evolution, the ancestor of the most primitive type of man was the most developed animal. When we look at the theory of Darwinism, they said that our ancestor as human being was the most developed form of animal. If we compare primitive man with the most developed animal, we find that there is an essential and inseparable differences. On one side, you see a flock of animals searching for food and struggling to survive. On the other side, we see primitive man. Frightened and confused by its strange taboos and beliefs or observed in its abstruse mysteries and symbols. We see there's a drastic difference in what man is and what an animal is. Even for the, for, the most, for the most basic form of human being, according to the theory of evolution, when we compare the basic form of a human being and the most advanced animal, we see that animals continue doing what they are doing. Yet man, which is supposed to be an evolved form, was still so primitive trying to figure out what, what it is and everything around it. If we are supposed to be an evolved form of animals, then shouldn't we have already been way past that? So when we start to look at myself as a Muslim, we must first understand myself as a human being. And the reason why I draw this comparison between an animal and a human being, and more so a Muslim, is that as we, as we look into our society today, we see that human civilization or human behavior is having a trend backwards towards a more animalistic behavior, a more animalistic attitude. Our, our, our being, our dress, let's take that for example. The way we dress, subhanAllah, 50 years ago, you know, the other day I was on the internet and I saw this meme on, on Facebook. And, and they were comparing uh, the clothing people wear to the beach 50 years ago to today. <laughs> SubhanAllah, and they attributed to global warming, it was a joke. But it made me start to think, 50 years ago, or let's say 100 years ago, a person will be almost fully clothed going to the beach. And as time is coming, as time moves forward, as we are getting more into technology and more advanced, so to speak, we find our clothing being lost. SubhanAllah, today it is actually encouraged in the summertime to wear less clothing. We find ourselves going back, to the, going back to a time or going back to a more animalistic behavior in which we are losing our sense of shame. 
So first and foremost, before we even begin to understand who am I as a Muslim, my first question is that who am I as a human being? We say a man has developed, but, it's only tr for, but it is only true for his mor mortal and outer history. But we must understand that we, are, we didn't come from animals. So many times when we find ourselves, uh, we find ourselves being compared, oh, we are only going back to nature. We didn't come from that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. And as Muslims, this is our first form of belief. Our first aspect of belief and understanding is that we are created things. We are created and we did not come from some single cellular organism that evolved over millions of years into this complex being that we see in front of the mirror when we look into it. We are created for a purpose in the way that we are created. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with intellect, Bless us with the ability to use our faculties of thought and build on upon our knowledge. For example, an animal just born are born with a natural instinct, but a human being needs to be taught. They need to be taught the etiquettes of the society and the knowledge of the previous generation. That is why you see birds have been fed the same way they were fed for the past 1,000 years. A tiger will hunt the same animals and in the same manner it, was, it hunted for the past 1,000 years. But today as human beings, we don't farm the same way. We don't feed ourselves the same way. We don't clothe ourselves the same way. SubhanAllah, we don't even speak the same language anymore. Even look at the Quran, look at the Arabic language. When we look at the language of the Quran, when the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the letters even look different. But by the name of Allah, we preserve the tongue. And this is one of the most preserved languages throughout time. But look at the English language, our native tongue. For the students who study Shakespeare, which is a mere five, six hundred years ago, maybe, I can't remember the exact timeline. It was so different the way that they speak from the way that we speak now. Because we are a people that continuously learn from our previous generation, from our, previ from, from our predecessors, so that we better ourselves. Right? We, we learn how to sacrifice for ourselves, sacrifice the things that we like for others around us. And that's a human trait. That's a human trait. How often do we look at the animal kingdom? How, oft, how often do we look out there in the wild and we see an animal giving up its food, except in the case of a mother to a child or a father to a child, but in a natural state, giving the things that it has for others that aren't related to it. But in Islam, we are taught this. As a human being, it is part of what helps our society for the collective good. We think that Islam is something different, something that is alien to our society. One scholar, he rightly put it, he said, intelligence, when we start thinking about things, we can't just think of things in a very simplistic way anymore. And many times Muslims, we just look at things as black and white. And my dear brothers and sisters, I would like for you to bear with me a little bit as I'm exploring this, because we will get to that point where we are talking about who we are as a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created human beings after he created uh, the angels, after he created the jinns. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind as the best of all of his creations. And he showed us when he commanded the angels and commanded uh, shaitan, Iblis at that time who was among the angels to bow down to mankind, to show our superiority because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he made us to be such physically weak creations compared to the angels and the jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again uh, has given us the ability, the ability to talk to go much, much higher, both in a spiritual sense and in a physical sense of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he went and received the gift of salah. Went higher than angel, even Angel Jibreel alayhi salam was able to go to. Intelligence is not a, it is not a, it is not an animalistic thing. It is not zoological. It is a human trait. It's of human origin. So before we ask ourselves, who we are as Muslims, we should approach this from an intellectual perspective, from a point of intelligence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this quotation in the Quran very often, Afala ta'qilun. Allah would mention something to us and then say, don't you have sense? Don't you have a, 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 
an ability to interpret and understand things. Because when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam start preaching Islam to the Arabs, start preaching Islam to the Meccans, what did he come with? Did he come with something that they already have? No, he was telling them something new. And when you look at the characteristics of the Arabs, what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was preaching, they didn't want any of it. Primarily because what Islam was saying, they were afraid that it would affect it would affect their finance, their income, their source of income, their financial superiority that they had for the surrounding tribes. Similarly today, when we look at Islam, many Muslims, and more so the kuffar out there, they look at Islam as something barbaric, as something ancient, as something that doesn't, has a place, that doesn't have a place in the world with us. We don't need to figure that answer out. Let us go back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did he walk into Mecca and say, you must pray, stop drinking alcohol, put on the hijab, dress properly? No. What was the first thing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught to the people? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. As a matter of fact, salah became compulsory till a very short period before migration. This almost 13 years after prophethood, after the advent of prophethood. There's a manner in which how we approach our Islam. Some people are to the level where they will stand and pray hours and hours in the night, subhanAllah, and alhamdulillah for that. And some people are still struggling to pray five daily salah, and that should be our most basic form of existence as human beings. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the way that he approached teaching Islam, he approached it from a very practical perspective and in a manner that we as Muslims should learn to implement it in our lives. Because we can't go from zero to a hundred in no time at all. We must take time for us to get anywhere. So Islam started to teach us first, La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us for us to use our faculty of thinking. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would draw parables, he would draw, uh, he would look, he would point out the weaknesses of the beliefs of the people around them. Not to condemn them, but for them to think, initiate thought in their heads. Today when someone come at us and attack us for being a Muslim, instead for us using that as an opportunity to enlighten them, we fight back. But when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was accused of being a what? A soothsayer, a magician? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say? No, I am not that. I don't know the future. I don't know anything other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me. And he went to enlighten them. So the first aspect of our being as a Muslim is knowledge. And that is point one. There are three points that I'll be speaking about today. And the first one is knowledge. And this is shown its importance by the first word revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mankind. Iqra. Iqra. Read. And what is the purpose of reading? The purpose of reading is to gain knowledge. To know something. Because how can we be a people who identify as someone who believe in la ilaha illallah without knowledge of who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without knowledge of who was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we must believe that Muhammad is the last and final messenger of Allah and we have to follow him but how can we do that without knowledge of that? As we look around in our society today one of the reasons why and let us look back for the one, past 100 years one of the reasons for the destruction of the Muslim community is because of the lack of knowledge in the masses of people. Because of the lack of proper Islamic knowledge in the masses of people. Why? Because we have prioritized academic learning over Islamic knowledge. I'm not saying that learning the sciences is not good. Of course it is. It is an essential for our life in this world. And I'm not saying that we have to sacrifice either for the other. As people who are believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is required upon us to make greater sacrifice than others. 
It is required upon us to give up more than others because part of our belief is sacrificing our desires, sacrificing the things that we might want and that we, sh that, that we find so beautiful. But we give it up because it will take us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is iman. To get up from our sleep and pray Salatul Fajr, that is the most beautiful sleep, right? But that is sacrifice to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how will we be able to sacrifice that without the knowledge of its importance? Without the understanding the reason why I'm doing this? That is why today we look into the masjid and subhanAllah many brothers pray the salah and we look into our communities and magnitude of women wear what we call hijab, cover their heads and try to cover their bodies. But yet we find immorality more rampant now than ever. We find Muslims, subhanAllah, in our community, it's a talk, the longer the beard, the bigger the scamp because they're so untrustworthy. And no longer as a person who attends the mas masjid regularly being looked as a person of respect and better than those out there. Why? Because in our heart, there is a missing component. There's a missing component in our actions and that is ikhlas, sincerity. Because we do actions not understanding the reason for it, not understanding the purpose of it, not even knowing the blessing of it. We become like robots, like an aeroplane, an autopilot, just do what it has to do, but it fulfills no true purpose and therefore, therefore in our heart, the effect that is supposed to be there isn't there. So who am I as a Muslim? How much do I know about Islam? We want to stand and defend Islam. We want to say, no, we aren't like that. Yet when a person poses a question to us, how is it that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was over 50 years old and marry an eight-year-old girl and we can't answer that yet? We claim to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we can't defend our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is something that every single Muslim should know. We know very little of our deen, so our first role as a Muslim is to educate ourselves. Educate ourselves, because without knowledge we can be very, very easily misguided. As we see today, people play, claiming to be believers, claiming to be Muslims, and they negate or they deny the finality of the Prophet of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People claiming to be Muslims, yet orally, publicly, with disregard the saying of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as something I heard not too long ago where a brother stand up in front of a gathering and, and very clearly saying the words oh I know women are not supposed to go to the burial ground but I am telling you you can go when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clear as day prohibited this and for reason why is a Muslim going to say that because he doesn't understand each and every one of us today, we want to open the hadith, we want to open the Quran and read the translation and give our own fatwa, our own ruling. But we don't want to take the steps that are necessary to get there, the position and the place of a scholar. The place of a scholar, that is their responsibility. To open the Quran and open the hadith and explain it to us. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised their level so high. Are those who believe equal to those, are those who know equal to those who don't know? Because people with little knowledge, when they try to delve into the matters of Islam that requires knowledge, they end up changing this religion and doing a lot of stupid things. And yes, I'm using the word stupid things because when they do these actions out of juhul, out of ignorance, it causes the destruction of the Muslim community. As we see today, many people killing themselves and calling this as Islam. Why? Because they take one ayah. One ayah without understanding its purpose. And the same ayah, the person who doesn't know Islam, the person who isn't a Muslim, will use it and torment us and chastise us. As we see what is happening to our Muslim brothers and sisters today in so many parts of the world. Because of a few Muslims who don't understand this religion and take it upon themselves like if they have the ability and the responsibility to go into the Quran themselves. When scholars of Islam and the Sahabas and the Tabi Tabi'een have spent over 1,000 years explaining this religion for us, we think we are going to reinvent the wheel today? Do we think we have the ability to do that? No, my dear brothers and sisters, we must seek knowledge. We must walk this path of knowledge. 
We must struggle upon it because with knowledge comes light. Inna ilman nur. The more you know, that is why our elders, we must respect them so much. Because with the little knowledge they have and the experience that they have gained so much, that little knowledge can be so beneficial. Just imagine if we were to gain more knowledge, how much more that knowledge will be beneficial to us. So the first aspect is to be a person with knowledge. The second aspect that I would like for us to look at is the practical aspect of being a Muslim. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you, oh, we must pray salah, we all know that. I'm not going to tell you that we must give our zakah, we all know that. I'm not going to tell you that we must fast in the month of Ramadan, we all know that. I'm not going to tell you if you can afford it, go for hajj, we all know that. I'm not going to tell you, you have to believe in Allah because by the mere fact that we're here, we know this. We've already fulfilled and we already have knowledge of the five pillars of Islam. I'm not going to tell you that you have to believe in the angels of Allah. I'm not going to tell you that we can't deny any of the prophets of Allah, including Isa alayhi salam, including Musa alayhi salam, including Ibrahim alayhi salam. I'm not going to tell you we can deny, we cannot deny any of the revealed books of Allah from the Torah or the Zabur or the Injil or the Bible or even the Sahaf of Ibrahim. We cannot deny any of it or the truth of any of it. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that we must believe in Allah and we must believe in the last day and we must believe in predestination. This is something we must all know. But what we must remind ourselves is how much, do we, how much of what we know do we practice in our life? The identity of a Muslim is not so much as to how long his beard is or how big his scarf is or how much the veil is. The identity of a Muslim or what people see out there and the value is our actions and the personality of a Muslim. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us in a hadith that the heaviest thing, the heaviest thing on, on, on the scales on the day of Qiyamah is be, will be what? Husnul Khuluq. Good character. How many Muslims today can we say have that? How many Muslims today can we have that trust in them that they will protect my right? How many Muslims today can we be trusting them to go to, to seek help and, 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 be, and trusting that they will keep my weakness to themselves? How many Muslims today or how many communities can we be part of that we can be confident, confident that if I am facing a difficulty, I can go to my masjid, I can go to a wealthy brother who is a Muslim and he will help me because I need that help. How many of us today can stand to my neighbor and tell them, be like me, look at me and see this epitome of character, this best of behavior, how can, how can we look at our wives and our children and tell them, take from my example as I have taken from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. It is something we speak about, but it is very, very little implemented in our lives and in our community. And sometimes it lacks from proper tarbiyah. It lacks from knowledge. And, it, and it, it, there's a reason for this. It, it lacks, the reason it is lacking is because of many factors. And we already speak about knowledge, we're not going to go into that. But what little do we have in our lives today we can practice? All right, how many of us memorize the whole Quran? Not many people here. We don't have to memorize the whole Quran to be a very good Muslim. Not, any, not every one of us will have the opportunities to go study Islam. We don't have to be a scholar to be a very good Muslim. What made the Sahaba Zadwan so great and made their Islam so strong was one very simple thing. Whatever they learned, they practice. They, it is said that the Sahaba Zubanallahi alayhim, they will take 10 ayah, 10 ayah per time from Rasulullah, 10 ayah at a time from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then they would go and learn it, understand it, learn everything about it and perfect it in their lives before they come to learn something else. Today, <laughs> subhanallah, we just want to learn and learn and learn and learn and we know and we practice very little of what we learn. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his words were so simple. His words were so simple and we memorize them as little kids. Yet how many of us remember to simply to say, Allahumma, in, Allahumma aftahli abwaaba rahmatik before we enter the masjid. Something simple as that. 
How many of us remember that when we see a Muslim on the road and we can recognize them as a Muslim, do I say assalamu alaikum to them without fear in our heart? How many of us get up and come to the masjid even though, even though we know the importance of it? Rather, not, no, we find excuses why we can't do it. Why we can't give our zakah? Why I can't leave that job that pays me from interest? Why is it that I can't wear my hijab because I'm afraid of people laughing me on the road? Our identity involves greatly us practicing that which we know. Because if we don't practice that which we know, we'll become as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described in Israel in the Quran as donkeys carrying books. It can't benefit them. They can carry it, but it does of no benefit to them. All that we know, all of the hadith, the tens or hundreds or even thousands of hadith that we memorize and many and many of ayat of the Quran that we memorize, how much of it do we put in our life? After here, after we finish today, and let us say we go downstairs for dinner and all this food is finished and one plate is there and there's a brother there who, who wants that food. Am I going to give it up for him? Or let's say a parking spot on the road. SubhanAllah, people fight for parking spot all the time. Right? There's a parking spot in front of your home. And there's someone there, a Muslim. Forget it. Let us, a Muslim brother. Who you see there looking, going for that parking spot. How many of us are going to give it up for him? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. None of you truly believe in Allah until you love for your brother that which we love for yourself. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam exemplified this, when, when the sahabas of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated that never was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked for something that, that the answer was ever no. He always give. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed so much of us, especially the Muslims living in the United States of America. We might consider ourselves in a bad situation sometimes. But there are millions around the world who are, subhanAllah, a thousand times, maybe even more than that, worse than us. And we might have a nice bank account, yet, when a Muslim is there in need, subhanAllah, how many of us will strive and struggle and search for that Muslim in need to give to them? And it's not like we weren't given these practical examples before. There are countless narrations and countless stories of different people, of the pious people, our pious predecessors, and even until today, that whatever wealth they have, they give it away. Subhanallah, there's a narration of a, of a pious predecessor that, subhanallah, whenever he's given anything, he would not go home until it's all distributed to the poor. All of it. Look at Abu Bakr radiallahu an, when he used to be given a very small amount from the Baytul Mal, from the Baytul Mal as payment for his duty of Khalifa, not an Imam. Not an ordinary job, the Khalifa, the emperor of the Islamic empire. Very small. And his wife wanted to make a nice meal. Not very extravagant, but something a little bit better. You know how she, how she went about gathering the money for that? A little bit every day. A little bit from every paycheck. A little bit from what he's brought home. And then she had enough to make an okay meal. When he saw this, what did Abu Bakr radiallahu anh say? Was he, oh, alhamdulillah, mashallah, and they gave and started. No. The first thing he was concerned. Where, we get, where do we get this money from? How come can we afford to do this? Because he knows how much he brings in. Then she went about, oh, every day you bring, I will take so much, so much. You know what Abu Bakr radiallahu anh did? He went back to the keeper of the Baytul Mal. He said, reduce my salary by that amount because that was extra for me. Now, I'm not asking us to do that. That's very difficult. But that should be our lifestyle. A Muslim is one who is humble. A Muslim who is one who is simple. A Muslim is not one who indulges in extravagance. Yes, there are times in which, subhanAllah, Allah bless some more than others. And yes, there is no harm in indulging in it a little bit. But we should have that limit. We should be a person that, are, that is conscious about themselves at all times. Because we aren't a Muslim only when we step out of our door. We aren't a Muslim only when we put on the thawb to come to the masjid. We aren't a Muslim only when we are among Muslims. No, we are a Muslim 24-7 from the minute we are born until the time we die. We are a Muslim. From the way we sleep to the way we behave with our family, to the way we speak, the way we walk, the way we dress, the way we think should be like that of a Muslim. Should be something that is pure, 
Something that is constantly trying to get to the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best of example. As Aisha radiallahu anha says, she said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she described him as a walking Quran. One thing that is lost in our community today is the aspect of mercy. And I would like to speak a little bit of this because this is something very, very important for the heart of a believer. Mercy. And I'd like to quote the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said, Man la yarham la yurham. Whoever doesn't show mercy will not be shown mercy by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah. And mercy takes many forms. Mercy comes when we are on the road and someone cuts, off, cut, cuts, off, cuts us off for us not to you know, scream at them. You know, show patience with them. Mercy is that when someone who is under our authority, that will be lenient with them when they make mistakes. For verily, we want people to be lenient with us when we make mistakes. Mercy is that we, when we enter our homes as fathers, that we treat our wives with kindness. Even though sometimes you might be tired out of your mind. But when, because when we're out there and a stranger is to come speak to us, we will treat them in the best possible way, isn't it? Why is it that we can't show our best part, our best character, our best behavior to our wives and our children? Subhanallah, in the Muslim community, in the Muslim community, from the very short time that I've been involving in the Muslim community, in our Muslim community, there have been so much cases of spousal and child abuse that is prevalent in our Muslim community. Sometimes we don't even know when we are doing it. Why? Because it comes back to the first one. We don't even realize, we don't even know what, what abuse is. Shouting at a toddler to stop doing something when they don't even know what you're saying, that's abuse to that child. It's like if somebody walk into the masjid and starts speaking in clicks and twangs and telling us to do something and shouting at you. You have no idea what they're saying. But we expect a child to listen to us. We expect as adults that when we are dealing with our children to exhibit the level of responsibility and maturity that we took maybe 20, 30 years to achieve. And we're going to be harsh on them. I'm not saying not to motivate your child and not to teach them that which is good, but we should be moderate as to how we deal with them. Because these things have lasting impacts. It is no wonder that many of our young people, as they reach the age in which they are liberated from their family, are they able to liberate themselves, they leave their homes and they go away. Our young Muslim sisters take off the hijab. Why? Because it was never taught to them properly in the home. I said, why are you wearing hijab? And they didn't develop a love for it because why? Their parents beat them to put on the hijab rather than to teach them the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us. Our behavior doesn't only affect ourselves, my dear brothers and sisters, it affects our families. It affects the future generation. Show mercy. Show mercy on your wives, on your children. Wives, show mercy on your husbands as well. And I'm not going to get into that. I don't want the sister stopping me downstairs, but inshallah, that'll be dealt with at another time. But we have to show mercy. Show mercy to that animal that we probably own. You know, in America, you don't have, that, have it that much of people abusing animals, especially in New York City. But if we are people that do that, let us be careful. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call us to account in the day of Qiyamah. And if we are people who are in authority over others, if we are a teacher, if we are a supervisor, if we are the owner, if we are a CEO, let us remember that the people under us, they're human beings. They're not animals, they're not robots. We want our superiors, we want those in authority over us to show us leniency and be merciful and understanding to us. Then let us demonstrate that as one quotation I once heard, treat people in the way that you really want to be treated and people are going to like you. But we're not doing this for people to like us. Yes, alhamdulillah, it's a good byproduct. But we're doing this to seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because on the day of Qiyamah, when we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and our entire lives will be played in front of us, and each and every single one of our shortcomings will be shown to us, we will want the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because without the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of us will enter the jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَيُّ نَجِّ أَحَدُ مِنْكُمْ بِعَمَلِهِ 
None of you will enter Jannah by the, by, the, by the worth of your actions alone. So let us be people that show mercy. Right? Another important aspect that is missing from our Muslim community is our masjid. What is our masjid? From the inception of the Islamic society, the first establishment of the Islamic society was in Medina. When the Muslims were going to establish, this is a community, this is ours. The first thing established was the masjid. As a matter of fact, the first masjid built by the Prophet wasallam was in Quba on his way to Medina. They didn't even reach Medina as yet. And they established the masjid. The masjid is a central point of the Muslim community. The masjid is a place that brings Muslims together. Each and every one of us is part of a masjid, should be part of a masjid, should be part of a community. And I'm not saying if you're a member of Masjid al Siddiq, you can't help Masjid al Quran wa Sunnah, or you can't help the Masjid and the Vanlit. No. But our communities are the one, each, if each and every one of us work towards the development of our community in itself, then together, all of that together strengthens the Muslim Ummah. But when we don't have loyalty to a single jama'ah, then where will our communities be? When our loyalties are not to a single, okay, I'm a Muslim, go to anywhere, then where's your loyalty? Which community are you helping to build? Which community is your child part of? Which community is your wife part of? Which community do you expect to read your janazah when you die? And you don't want, I don't, I'm not part of no masjid. I hear many Muslims say that. But we should be. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Yadullahu fawqal jama'a. That the help of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the bounties of Allah is upon the jama'ah, the people who come together and work together. Hence the name of a masjid, another name for it is what? A jama'ah. And salat al jumu'ah? Congregation, Muslims coming together. So let us find ourselves. If today we aren't part of a masjid, we haven't given our loyalty, our allegiances to a community. And yes, this is part of Islam. Bay'ah, giving bay'ah is part of Islam. Because when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before he went to, Mac before he went to Medina, what did he take from the people of Medina? A bay'ah, an allegiance to them, from them. We give our allegiance to our community for the sake of Allah, for, to foster the development of our communities. Because why? Our communities are weak. Subhanallah, yesterday for Salat al-Jum'ah, I'm 100% sure this masjid was filled and over, overflowing. Yet today, a program for our community. Look, look at our gathering. Because why? Our jama'ah is weak. And when the jama'ah is weak, then the entire community is weak. And the ummah as a whole becomes weak. And one thing we see all over the world today, one thing that is, that is weak in our ummah is our masajid. Our masjid is no longer the most important place in our life. We would give up going to the masjid because we got to go hang with some friends. We would give up going to the masjid because we want to go watch a movie. We would give up going to the masjid because we have a family gathering. And these are just some of the simple ones. I don't want to go to the other bad ones. But we have all of these excuses. But if you had to go meet, you know, the mayor or the governor, or you had a, an appointment with the immigration offices, you better believe it. You're going to leave it all to go there. But yet when we have to come meet the Malakul Muluk, the king of kings, and come and visit his home, we have a thousand and one excuses. We have a thousand and one reasons. My dear brothers and sisters, strengthen the masjid. Let our children's heart be attached to the masjid. Let our hearts be attached to the masjid. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said what? A person who will be shaded under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yawm al-Qiyamah is one whose heart is attached to the masjid. And let us not wait until we achieve old age. None of us know how old we're we going to become. We, do you know if you're going to live to see tomorrow? We don't know. We don't know if we're going to live to see 40 years or 50 years or 60 years. Alhamdulillah, the brothers with the white hair that are in the masjid, ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them and they're here in the masjid. But we don't know if we're going to be there. For the brothers who are married and have kids, what are you going to teach your child? You can't tell your child, go to the masjid, but I'm going to sit down in front of the TV. Or subhanAllah, in the worst case, when your child wants to go to the masjid, you can tell him, no, the weather is too cold outside. And that's, what, that, that's not what we want in our community. We should be encouraging them. 
getting them up, waking them up, push them out of the door, go to the masjid, our sisters need to do the same. Put your husbands out of the house, send them to the masjid. A blind man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked me, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I'm blind and can I be excused from coming to the masjid for the, you know, the salah in the dark? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thought for a while and asked him, can you hear the adhan? He said, yeah, yes, Ya Rasulullah, he said, come to the masjid. And this was a blind man, what excuses do we have? Brothers coming to the masjid, you know, when it's snowing a little bit and when the rain is falling. Brothers, why are you not joining the salah? Yes, we understand Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do that, but do we want to do the bare minimum? Do we want to be the people who are the minimalists when it comes to our practice of deen? No, we must strive to be better. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, tells us this, every day should be better than the one before. So as Muslims, let us remember, let us come together, let us come back to the masjid, invite someone to the masjid tomorrow, bring a friend to the masjid, bring a colleague, bring a cousin, bring a relative. You bring them to the masjid, it's reward for you. And if they continue coming here, that even after you die, it is reward for you. And everyone that they bring because of that, it's reward for you. Subhanallah, look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the final aspect that I'd like to touch on before we, we, cl we, we close off everything here today is the concept of hijab. And this is the, 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 uh, the last part of our practical Islam, a hijab. What is the purpose of hijab, my dear brothers and sisters? Before we understand anything and its importance, we must know its purpose. The purpose of hijab, especially for our sisters, is to prevent prying eyes from looking at them. To be a, not a source of attraction, rather the opposite of that. That is the purpose of hijab. The women in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were so worried about this that when they used to walk on the sides of the road, they'll be walking so close to the corner until their clothing will be tugging on the walls. Because they were, they were very, very much in understanding of this and it's important they didn't want to call attraction to themselves because a, a person who dresses to call attraction to themselves and they do that and, and are a source of fitna in our community, they will be held accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, please do not say, oh, it is their fault for looking. You can't leave a million dollars in the middle of the road and then blame other people for taking it, can you? That's stupid. Let us not be like that. We are Muslims. Let us understand our purpose. Our true purpose is to worship Allah, to be obedient to Allah. And in the obedience of Allah is the absolute refinement of the character of the human being. As imperfect as we are in the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will find the absolute best manner of being a human being, which is a being a good Muslim. So let us remember that. <coughs> Excuse me. Alhamdulillah. Let us not forget that our purpose is to serve Allah. And the purpose of our hijab is to protect ourselves. For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advises, men have evil hearts. We know how men think. Isn't that so, brothers? Each and every single brother here, every single man knows the mind of a man. I'm, I mean, average man. I'm not talking about people who are strange in different ways. But the average man, we know how we think. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the nature of every one of his creation. He knows the nature of a man. He knows the nature of a woman. He knows the nature of a child. He knows the nature of an adult. He knows the, the nature of an elderly. And he knows the nature of an animal as well. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam direct us to something, there is a reason for that. And we don't even have the ability to recognize all of the facets of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his infinite wisdom, from his infinite knowledge, give us a ruling. And if we are people who testify, yes, I surrender to Allah because to be a Muslim means one who surrenders. If I surrender to Allah, then I surrender my hawa, I surrender my own desires and my shahwa. My own emotions are the thing that we like and only comply to that which he command me to. So the hijab is to protect us from that. So brothers and sisters, we should not be asking ourselves, oh brother, is my clothes too tight? If you're asking that question, then yes, it's too tight. Oh brother, why can't I put, tie my, my, my hair at the top of my head like a camel's hump? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam curses such a woman. 
Brother, why can't I pluck my, my eyebrows? Because it is wrong in Islam. It is haram in Islam. It shows displeasure with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brother, why can't I wear a top that is not, you know, long enough? Or why my pants, why can't I wear a pants that is tight? Why can't I wear an anklet? You ask yourself that question. Is this something that's attracting people outside? Why can't I wear lipstick? You know why you wear the lipstick. You want to look beautiful. MashaAllah, keep that for your husband. Keep that for your home. Islam is not a sexist religion. Islam is a practical religion. Islam is a religion that teaches us things that are, from a holistic point of view will make us better people with moral integrity, which is very, very important. And strength of faith. Because you cannot, you cannot be a person of Iman, yet you want to walk the road half naked. That isn't, that doesn't go together. You understand what I'm saying? Similarly for the brothers, we shave our beards and have clean faces, and this is a sunnah of Rasulullah, and I'm not saying everybody have their reasons for their shortcomings. Our objective is to get ourselves to that place where we have the strength of faith and the conviction and the strength of will to do it. Because to find excuses is so easy. To find a will from our faith that is a difficult thing, and that, in that is a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a reward. So when we have find in ourselves, my dear brothers and sisters, and please remember, I am not here to make anyone feel bad. For truly, if I were to examine myself, I probably have more faults than any one of you here. My objective here is for us to remind ourselves. Remind ourselves of things that are blatant in front of our eyes that we can try to do. The physical things that we can do in our obedience to Allah. As I mentioned, we're not going to go to the acts of ibadat. We know that already. Let us look at the little things that we can do in our lives. And hijab is something that I'm very, very uh, worried about in our ummah because in the last 10 years alone, I've seen how the components or the, 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 the importance of hijab or what hijab is have been degraded to be a fashion today. To be a fashion. It's a hijab fashion. That's like saying this Two opposite things in the same sentence. You understand? That doesn't make sense. Because fashion is something that's supposed to be attractive, and hijab is supposed to be something that protects you from being attractive on the streets. So how can that be together? So my dear brothers and sisters, let us protect our deen. Let us protect our religion. Let us remember our core. Our core is being something higher than animals. Something with intellect. Something that we, that we must think about. Think about Allah. Know this deen of Allah. Know the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Know Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And let us remember that everything in our life Everything in our life is back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us give the rights of, of, of others. Let us not take away the rights of others. And the thing about women that, you know, I didn't went much into it. But my dear brothers and sisters, before I close, let us give the rights of, to our sisters that they deserve. It is sad today when you speak to young women and they tell you, brother, I have no interest in school. Why? Oh, my father said, I, I, you know, there's nothing beyond this. I'm just going to get married and I can't do anything else. My dear brothers and sisters, let me ask you something today. Who is your first teacher? Your mother. Isn't that so? She's a, your first teacher. And she will continue teaching you as much as she knows until you can no longer learn from her. And she is also your best teacher. Why? Because the way she molds you is the way you live your life. So let me ask you something. Don't you think more your wife or your daughter knows don't you think it would be better for your children? Yes or no? You'd rather have a stranger come in and teach them than Islam, or you have your wife teaching them? Yes, fathers fulfill their role, but they are not the most important figure in a child's life. It's the mother. Educating our sisters today is educating our ummah tomorrow. Obviously, we have to teach them and train them well, so when they're out there in this world, they, are, they protect themselves and they're trained properly and they love Islam and they stand up as upright women. But we must do our part first and never ever make them feel inferior. The longest Islamic, existing Islamic university in the world was established by a woman, which is even older than, than Jamat al-Azhar in Egypt. It's in Morocco, established by a Muslim woman. So how today can we take away 
the opportunity of seeking knowledge from our Muslim sisters. Let us be careful of this, my dear brothers and sisters. Let us not be people who are selfish. Let us not be people that are coarse in speech and coarse in behavior. Let us be people that are completely subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obedient to him. For in that is success. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll close with this ayah when he said in the Quran, Say verily my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah. No one shares that with him. I am the first and foremost of those who submit and devote to him. And this is Surah Al-An'am. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وآخر دعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر